<laughs> I was waiting for that. Are we live? Now we're, now we're live. They missed it. I think they missed it. <laughs> All right. Any other thoughts on the government? You got to turn it on. Any other thoughts on the government? That's a broad thing. <laughs> the government as it pertains to fallen angels. Well, a lot of speakers. Uh, yeah, I think that uh, just like the Nazis, uh, remember they looked at the they looked at the entities as non-human entities wherever they came from. So, uh, and then the whole thing with the Foo Fighters and their see the Nazis at the very end engaged a whole world in the in the in the early forties a whole world of them of of UFOs and Foo Fighters and and so their belief was uh, already helping to open the door. In the 40s, then of course we have you know Babylon working. We have the Roswell incident. You have all kinds of stuff break open in the 40s. With the United States government, with them taking in everything, I I personally believe, and even in the underground stuff, the Psy Warriors and the rest, the stories are very clear. They are on a telepathic level, they say, communicating with entities, non-human entities. So if they look at them as alien or as a master race, I mean, when you have folks that are in the U.S. military, Defense Department, uh, DIA, CIA, uh, individuals uh, that um, are remote viewers out of Stargate that believe in extraterrestrials and beings, uh, one of the Stargate uh, individuals who wrote the book Psychic Warrior, uh, David Morehouse, <laughs> in the book talks about how he engaged an entity out there. And Ed Dames and the rest. So they're all all the remote viewers that were in the military. They're they're also believing in an engagement. So um, I believe it's very similar to the Nazis, uh, but maybe even maybe even broader. Let me just add to that real quick. I, I concur with Russ. Um, allegedly, and this is you know apocryphal stuff. Someone asked uh, Werner von Braun, you know, where did you guys get this from? And he just said, we had help from them. Um, we've heard that quote that's been kicked around UFO. Um, there's, a, there's a series called Taken that Steven Spielberg was the executive producer of. And that is the most on, spot on presentation I've seen on the subject. And they take it from the Foo Fighters to present day. And they get the abduction phenomena, they get the breeding program, they get what they're looking for. The conclusion is very similar to what I would believe in, except they sort of couch it as a benevolent thing. And the, the, the hybrid being who they've been waiting for is a little girl instead of a little boy, but she can stop time. She can, you know, do, she's got telekinesis powers. She's got power. And I think that, that the governments, um, I think it's just like the days of Noah when the Book of Enoch, when there was a quid pro quo when you give us access to the female population, we'll show you this technology. Can I prove that? No. But Philip Corso, the late Philip Corso, before he died, and you know, why would, why would he print a book like this? Talked about the dissemination of so-called um, alien, or whatever you want to call it, fallen angel technology that he, they, they back engineered from the Roswell crash. So there's a lot of apocryphal stories out there floating around. And my gut feeling is, is what, what Farr has said on the Fox News channel, that, that, you know, extraterrestrials are running the government. That doesn't surprise me at all. You know, it really doesn't. Like I said, Al Gore was born nine after. All right. The next question, uh, do you believe a person is can be forced to take the mark of the beast? And I'm assuming that this pertains to the, the implant. Well, let's, let's walk through that, it, depending on when we think we're going to get beamed out of here. Um, I think we're beamed out before we are forced one way or the other. Okay, that's my personal opinion. I don't think we're going to be around the scene of that. I hope I'm right. But um, I just can't believe that the Lamb's going to allow us to go through uh, the, the whole bloody bride deal. You know, it's like, well, I love your church, but you're going to go through hell in a handbasket. I just, I just <laughs> got a problem with that. But um, that's a really interesting question. If, it, if, they, if they force someone to take it, then free will isn't involved. I got a hunch people will be lining up for this thing 
and I, I mean it, lining up for it, fighting over to get it. Think about it. Let's say we've all seen cancer. We know what it does. So, you know, um, you're married. That is just a scenario. And you're, you find out that, oh, my God, your wife has terminal stage four cancer. And, you know, two weeks later, these guys land and our government comes out and we've known about them and now they're here and blah, blah, blah. And they've got this DNA chip and, you know, some of your neighbors rush. You're, you're kind of hesitant at first. And, and, you know, we hear reports and people are getting healed and spontaneous healings and people are regenerated. And you look at your neighbor who was 60. Now he looks like he's, you know, 40 or something. I mean, who knows how far this thing's going to go? Look. Let me just end with this because I could blab on for, for a while on this on this subject. In in the Bible, it talks about Abraham and Sarah. They're 90 years old. I wrote about this in the Cosmic Chess Match. They're 90 years old, and and you know, God who's got a great sense of humor shows up and goes, Hey, guess what? This time next year Sarah's gonna be pregnant. <laughs> you know, and 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 he does a face plant. Abraham just does a face plant, and they go, Hey. Nothing works anymore. I'm being, we're all adults here, but that's what he's saying. And Sarah's laughing. You know, I'm way old past the age of childbearing years. How's this going to happen? Why is it that when they go down to Egypt, Pharaoh wants her in her harem? Is it possible? Is it, and this is the work of Chuck Missler. Thanks, Chuck. Is it possible that Sarah and Abraham were regenerated? That he reversed the clock? Why would, why would Pharaoh want a 90-year-old woman in the harem? Think about that. Come on, my mom, my grandma, my mother is 92 and lives with us. I love my mom dearly, but this is not hair and material, trust me. <laughs> I'm sorry, Lynn. So it's like, that's, you know, I, that's what I think. I think this mark is going to be something that's, that's way beyond anything, you know, we got to think outside the box. Revelation 13, the uh, mark, um, remember again, the ascendancy of the false prophet. Uh, this is very important in all of this because that mark doesn't begin to be operative until the ascendancy of the false prophet. Revelation 13, the mark is coming out. The image of the beast is ordered to be made. Then it does say in that chapter that then he, the false prophet, through these means will cause forced worship of the beast. Now, that's, a, I mean, a pressured thing, not in the sense of maybe free will, but, you know, the Jews, they all had to get stamped, you know, to, do, to be identified. So part of the issue of the mark, the original Greek word means a branding. It's like a cow getting branded. So there's an identification issue, let alone whatever else is you know, involved with it. Uh, but you have the issue of those who don't take it. So it's clear in the prophetic form that there are those who are not going to, that they're either going to perish or they're not going to be able to buy or sell and things like that. And so there's this whole battle of who will and who won't. But there's nothing in the book of Revelation that talks about, and even depending on your time you go out of here, um, pre or mid or whatever post, um, there are those who still believe many people are going to get saved during the tribulation. But what do they do? Um, and so I, I believe that uh, it'll, it'll be very clear that because of Revelation, we don't see any example of a believer having to take it. And that's a good, that's a good sign. We have seen no believer having to take it. We see the other side of the fence where uh, it may be, again, they jump on board. This is a good thing. I'll be able to buy and sell. I'll be in the food program. I'll be in the new system. You know, uh, this is going to work. This is going to help save humanity. This is going to alter humanity. Uh, and, and, um, and, of course, we see nothing in the book of Revelation all the way to the end to where anyone gets out of it, though. Once in. That's it. It's Hotel, final. Hotel California. Hotel California. Yeah. All right. What do you believe that UFOs actually are? Someone wants uh, sort of an exp exp explanation. Uh, are they some sort of shape shifting aircraft? Are they craft made by the Nephilim? Are they something that they just use to travel in? That's, that's a really very complex question. <clears throat> um, there were, I spoke to Dr. Jesse Marcel Jr. before he passed away last year. <clears throat> and he was around 11 or 12 when his father, Jesse Marcel Sr., handled the, the wreckage from the Roswell crash. And he bought it back in a box from Mac Brazil's farm. And he set it on the kitchen table, and he got Jesse up and Mrs. Marcel up, and he said, 
This is from a, a craft that, that crashed that wasn't from our world. That's what Jesse remembers. <clears throat> and he handled all sorts of stuff. Um, the memory metal they talk about, which um, when you would roll up in a ball, it would just f flex out without a wrinkle. And, uh, and other artifacts. There seems to be nuts and bolts, what I mean by that. There's, there's, it's physical. But there also seems to be, from other re accounts that we've read, there seems to be almost that they're alive, that the ships are alive somehow. So it's a really, really weird mix. It's a really strange mix. And then you get the one mile wide motherships seen over the, um, well, seen in, in Stevensville, Texas, seen in the English Channel by a pilot with 14 people on his plane, a bunch of people on another plane, and radar. It's, it's a triple, you know, they've got it, three different sets of witnesses are seeing this thing. And the thing just vanished, it like cloaked. It's like it's it's like a mile, not even a mile, it's a mile wide, but it's about a mile away, and they're like, oh my gosh, and it just goes, foof, and it's gone. So it's it's a very complex, you know, mix. No one's got all the answers. I certainly don't, but um, we, it remains to be seen. I think a good example too is to see the other side of the fence when the chariot comes down to get Elijah. Was it real? Was it touchable? Was it nuts and bolts? What material? He got in it. He was swept away in it. He went up. So that's that's you know, in a real sense, a vehicle, a real sense, a, uh, a transportation device. And so we know that, you know, in, in, in that side of the heavenlies, per se, that there's some form of that. But obviously, it also dimensionally shifted over. So I, I, I look at all, all of it as, you know, when you see them, but the ability to, to, to shift or disappear and all the rest of them, they have to be other, other you know, otherworldly. They got to be other, you know, you know, coming from that realm, uh, alive uh, uh is there a supernatural component to that uh, are the physics of it i would just have to say for me anyway the physics of it are far far beyond just a biplane and that um, that control by the dark side and this is very important again for us to understand in the context of spiritual warfare because we got to understand whatever they you know orion's grays whatever else we know them as what these are not extraterrestrials per se these are extra dimensionals. And I still believe they are Cosmocrators, Archon, uh, Perneus Monomenikai, the those are the species. But those references in Ephesians, also the Spirit of God says, they are in the Epihuronauts, they are in the heavenlies. This is where they're, they're packed in the skies above us in, in dimensionally. So this is where we're gonna see so much of the activity. And um, they are part of the warfare. We, um, let me just say it this way. We know of a team that would love to take um, a spiritual warfare team that understands because when Jesus said, I've given you authority to do what? To tread upon, to trample all, you know, the, the snakes and scorpions to overcome all the power of the enemy and nothing will harm you. Is this not, um, can we not apply this to entities like this? Do not abductees get free of the entity visitations when they use the authority of Christ? So, I, I, I have not yet, I, I had somebody take me out and, and took a CIA guy out and so forth to this field and showed us this scope and they were showing us things that I thought, this is, I have never seen anything like this. Either they've got a trick, whatever they, whatever this is that I'm looking through, or this, this is beyond anything I've ever seen. But I thought, you know what, what we need to do is, and we talked about this in our teams before, I wonder if we are able to um, somehow, some way, apply a spiritual warfare attack or rebuke whatever because i've learned this jesus said i've given you authority over all you know all the power of the enemy and that's part of it so i wonder whether or not um the whole issue of them hiding staying away or when believers begin to really get in and see or whatever else i just wonder the application of warfare towards these things and if the craft issue or the vehicle issue if it's similar to what uh, Elijah had as far as a real thing to step into, step off of. Uh, but is it, a, is it something that could be struck since it would be from their side? Um, I think we need to uh, apply this, you know, apply authority uh, mm -hmm. into the heavenlies, let alone onto the ground around us and, and, and 
and, and test this out and see. Let me tag team on that too, if, if I may. Um, a number of years ago, Peggy and I were driving back from a nice spaghetti dinner coming up Pacific Coast Highway. It's winter time. It's about 830. It's pitch black. She's driving. I'm looking out the window. She goes, wow, what's that? Like, oh, looks like a plane. I'm looking at the thing. But, well, it's awfully bright. It's this bright light. Just kind of, you know, looks like when planes come at you, you see that bright light. I'm kind of looking at the thing. And so, you know, she's driving, so she's not looking at it. I'm looking at it. All of a sudden, here, here's the light like this, not moving, not moving at all. Now it's about maybe one, two minutes into the into the thing, and it's not moving. Well, maybe it's a helicopter. So here's the light. We talked about this in, in the first watchers. All of a sudden, ding, a light appears above it and slowly descends <laughs> into this light, and then the whole thing breaks up into concentric rings and disappears. And I go, oh, my gosh, we're not in Kansas anymore. And basically, I say that, and all of a sudden, bam, there it is. And it did this like three times. We pulled the car over. We sat there and watched it. So we talk about it. We go home, and we go to sleep. So 2.30 in the morning, I get the cosmic noogie on the head. You know, wake up. Yes, Lord, here I am. What do you want? And it's like, and basically what it was, is I, I, it's the woodshed experience, not that, you know, but it was, it was like, here you are writing books about this stuff and talking about it, and you don't, you don't take a, a warfare stance. You just sit there and look at it. And this is where the phrase rebuke first, ask questions later came from. This is what we're to do, and this is what tag teams in the rust. We see something, we're not sure what it is, rebuke them in the name of Jesus, and then discuss it later. You know, Because the moment, like me, you look at it and you become mesmerized. What is that? And now you're, now you're it's real, you're right in. Rebuke first, ask questions later. This question is, uh, can you further describe what that breed is? Yeah, Himmler was a, a breeder of chickens. And, you know, the idea if you breed horses, race horses, you know, you want the best stock to the best stock to the best stock. And the whole issue is breeding to get the best, right? So that was the concept, but it was a spiritually given concept. And I believe they got that from people like Dietrich Eckhart and, and Billy Gott and the rest of these sorcerer guys. They were really into the dark side. Anthony, Helena Blavatsky's materials, Secret Doctrine, all of that was part of this. Because she's the one that got the content from the entity that described the Hyperboleans, the Lumerians, and the Arians, and the rest, saying these are the real races of the human race. No, they weren't the real races. They were the real Nephilim races. That's all they were getting revelation on. And so um, their concept, though spiritually driven, was to find those who could in some sense, um, echo or evidence, some kind of Aryan background. Um, and a lot of that was physiological, and I'm not sure they even understood what to do about that. But, but back when he meant that if this German and this German could prove that they had some level of Aryan descent and say they had 2% possible Aryan blood, 2% possible Aryan blood, and if you can make them breed and have baby, the mentality was you would get a baby with four or eight percent Aryan blood. And then when that baby would get old enough, then you take another one of these, you know, more, you know, you know, higher Aryan babies and have them breed. And the concept was you'd be able to go keep going back to building the Aryan pure blood. Notice their issue constantly on every time you hear the Nazis talk about pure blood, they're talking about Nephilim, their idea of charged blood. Um, more than just even demonized. Uh, now, here's the, different, here's the difficulty with the Nephilim issues, though. Do we have Nephilim DNA by which we can test, you know, test anything, anybody else? Because have, we have folks that come up sometimes and say, I think I got Nephilim you know, DNA. Okay, go, get, go do a DNA test. Well, okay, that's fine, but how, the, do we have Nephilim DNA um, somewhere that we can test it all on? We, we don't. But we can't test whether it's pure human or whatever else. So the issue is just simply if they keep backbreeding and backbreeding and backbreeding, that the the power of that Aryan blood continues to build and build. The <clears throat> DNA is continually altered until eventually there might be physiological because they believe that they would physiologically change. Um, they would become taller, stronger, faster, smarter, and then the 
telekinesis, clairvoyance, oh, you know, uh, telepathy, powers, <clears throat> uh, supra powers would begin to be evident too in that process going backwards. Um, <clears throat> Gary Stearman made a comment not too long ago. We were talking um, at some conference, I think it was Orlando a while back, and uh, <clears throat> Gary and I were talking about the skulls and the possible DNA testing that we're trying to do and what the early microchondrial DNA testing had shown us. And Gary kind of leaned over and said, you know, L.A., Gary Stearman, keep looking up. No. <clears throat> he said, you know, L.A., um, they already know about this, and they're probably extracting the DNA and doing something with it. And it, typically, Gary is like five steps ahead of everybody else. I just went, oh, my gosh, you're right. And that ties in with Russ, because I don't think, we, we, Russ touched on it today in his talk, one of his talks, the idea that, you know, at the end of World War II, all these Nazis came into the country, Operation Paperclip. They were here, they are here. And who knows, the Fourth Reich, you know, the whole idea of, of being embedded in the government and the scientific community, and, and here we are. And, and, and so these guys want this stuff. And we know that the, the, larger, the large heads are being picked up by this one dealer in Belgium. And there's, there's this, you know, black market trading going on. And Benjamin is in a, Bel, Belgium is an occult center. So this stuff is, you know, the other side of the aisle, they want this stuff. And I think it's ongoing. And I, I think in every area, you do New Age, you do old occultism, mystery religions, traditional Satanism, the underground Satanism, the Nazi pure blood, you know, black flame order, uh, they all they all have the same concept. Even even Jack Parsons in the Mojave Desert, they, they all had the concept. They were driven, and this is why I'm saying, it comes from them, you know, impressing this into the hearts and minds of scientists and others and military people and political people to believe and, 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 and attempt. And, and so there's no question in my mind that the other side as Graham Hancock said, though not being a believer, here's, I, I agree with him on this subject, that these entities are there and that there's no question on a global scale, their desire is to engage humanity on a sexual level for the purpose of trying to create a hybrid race. They want something here. They want something on the ground. Now, my opinion in all of it, too, though, and I'm not going to give this as a, a flat-out infallible biblical interpretation, but my opinion is that the troops of Antichrist are a design of the dark side, their design, and that they have to be altered in some level or supra in some level, uh, far beyond what the Nazis were able to do in their day. Yeah. So, and, and, and if we remember the scripture verse, it talks about Satan's able to masquerade as an angel of light. I don't know, again, we, we need to really think in terms of what these beings are. He's a fallen cherub. Uh, the physics, the Greek word is meta schizmozitai. So they have the ability to morph their appearance without changing or altering their nature. They can morph into whatever. That's the physics, the abilities they have. So whether ascended master, whatever else, alien being, you know, whatever it might be that they need to do to bring a convincing, and they emanate energy, they emanate power. Just as you and I feel the power of the Holy Spirit, you know, you got to understand, you can feel. When I have... Demon, when people demonize manifesting dark power, you can feel that. You walk into a room, sometimes I can look over, and be, mainly because we've done it so many times and dealt with it, uh, it's like right there, there's a spirit in that person or on that person because they emanate a presence that is completely contrary. And that's hard for them to cloak, I think, but, but in their appearance to people, and this is important, Stargate United States military at Fort Meade, they started the program on remote viewing with Ed Dames and the rest of the guys. Um, we, ha we have to realize that all it was was a sanitized version of astraling out and like shamans have always done and the cults have always done. But Ingo Swan, who was the father of modern remote coordinate, re you know, re remote viewing, um, because here's the issue. All these remote viewers, including Edgar Mitchell and the rest of them now, are all engaging aliens. I'll give, give you one example. Courtney Brown, a professor. Already a new age ever got involved in, he's, he's written book after book after book now on the whole subject. What did he say he does? He, he, he is able to remote view and go out into, and he met Jesus, 
who had a Buddha, Buddha face and a Muhammad face in a square room, and, and, and Jesus was uh, guiding the universe, and it was the, 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 the headquarters for the galactic. And this is a professor giving all this information. You would not believe the interaction. And so remote viewers trained in, in this ability to go out, but the question is, where do they, where do they get the ability to go out? Um, and here's, this is very important to understand. When they do this, Ed Dames says that he remote viewed Satan. You heard, you heard that story? Ed Dames, the remote military remote viewer, said that he remote, remote viewed Satan himself, um, said that it scared the bejesus out of him. Satan was a cold, dark, crystalline being. So when I heard that on Coast to Coast, him talking and telling George, I just said, I always talk out loud when I hear the, you know, I hear people on Coast to Coast and I always answer back. It's like, or just, you're, you, know, you, you know, just, there's times I want to just jump in, okay? <laughs> so when, when he said this and Ed just saying, I, I remote viewed Satan, I was like, you know, I was, ha, you know, you, you remote viewed Satan. I said, it's the other way around. He, he surely viewed you and those, you know, these beings are so uh, beyond humanity. We have to understand this. A cosmocrator uh, is a is a spe you know a species of the dark side. Now, when I say this, this is important too. Jesus said in the gospel one time, "This kind comes out only by prayer and fasting." Right? The Greek word "kind," you know what it's used for? Species. This this species, this type. Like in the dog world, you got Chihuahuas, you got Great Danes. They're all dogs. So in that world, and those in the in the in the in the skies, and their abilities to morph, their abilities to change appearance, their abilities to to uh, to do what they do, let alone copy what's being done in heaven. So if a craft or a or a or a chariot comes down and sweeps up, and uh, physically Elijah is able to be caught up and go into it and go, um, then the other side can they do this? See, I, I think from the assumption of uh, Scripture that they have counterfeited, they've, they've counterfeited everything, basically. Um, that, that's, that's part of what they do in, in this process. And, and it's important that in the metaskids matatai, the morphing of their presence, there is, and, and once you engage that, once you, once you agree, once you begin to believe, once you begin to get into it, um, then... Uh, one inch, they take a mile, uh, and, and once they take a mile, they take, you know, they take 10. Uh, we had a girl that called us out there and had us look at these things in the sky. And here's the difficulty with the girl. This is a Christian girl. Called us out. We took a team out, including a guy that used to be a surveillance expert on U.S. Um, subs, CIA, and, and, and scan, and this is a guy that believes that there are real stuff. He said, there's no questions. The Russians believe it. No question. The United States believes it. He says, I've seen, you know, this guy's telling me he's seen things. So I took him out with me to this, meet this person. And we all saw what we saw. I can't explain it, but it was not an airplane and it was dimensional shift. And, and, um, but the more she engaged it, all of a sudden when she's at home, she would look out and now they're at her house. When she was out at her horse barn, and all of a sudden she's entertaining, she's she's entertaining without any kind of, uh, you know, in the sense shielding or discernment or or warfare, you know, uh, you know, response. And she got more and more to where she began to feel they were coming closer to her and trying to communicate, and that she began to talk to them. Now we warned. Um, to me, that's no different than playing with a Ouija board in a sense. The real entity's there, and you begin to play. Oh, something's really happening here. Let's do more to see more happen. <clears throat> Every inch they get, it's a deeper hook, and in, in, in includes incredible supranatural uh, uh, deception. And uh, authority needs to be applied immediately in, in our understanding of this. And that sometimes tests the waters. It, you know, there's times when we, someone comes into the office and says, I think I got, I got a demon on me, you got to do this. Well, we can test the waters. If there's a real demon expressing authority, is going to engage, is really going to engage. So, uh, I guess we look forward to, uh, at some point, um, seeing, and I guess if you see something, go ahead, you know, just say, Lord, just, you know, just go and, and, and uh, express spiritual warfare like you do anything else uh, when it comes to the demonic side, and uh, see what occurs. Ask the Lord for wisdom. Amen. But accept that you have authority over all the power of the enemy, let alone the, just, you know, that he's there to shield us too. Amen.
this next question is, do you believe that there are underground bases and labs where they're doing experiments genetically, uh, DNA modification, and this is with humans? Absolutely. Absolutely. Are you kidding me? Um, once, once the Darwinists uncovered the genome and, and understood what DNA was, is um, these are men with no ethics, no morals, there is no God, and they get to play, you know, they get to play God. They get to do what they want to do. There is a hall, allegedly, at, at an underground base um, in Dulce, Mexico. Never been there, don't want to be there. Uh, we've heard lots of stories, you know, you, you can go on the internet and, and, and read it for yourself. It's, it's, some of the stuff is way out. Who knows? There's no way to vet it. Uh, but one of the one of the stories is there's a there's a place called the Hall of Horrors, and in this in this area are all these genetic experiments, um, you know, people with octopus in limbs, whatever. Um, not, you know, this is why the movie Splice when it came out, which I wouldn't see. I re I just read about it and went, no, nah, I'm not going to go see this thing, but I blogged about it and then talked against it. But it's conditioning. People will go. Ever watch people in a movie theater? Next time you're in a movie theater, turn around and look at the audience behind you. You know what they look like? That's what they look like. You don't think that that's brainwashing? Are you kidding me? And you know, this, the movie Splice is the whole idea of, well, you know, we're gonna we're gonna mess around with the DNA. We'll just get some chicken embryo over here and then mix it with this and but then we'll destroy it well let's not destroy it okay let's see what happens all right and <clears throat> they let it grow well before the movie came out or right after the movie came out a while in that in that period of time great britain you know makes this big headlines the uk announces destroys 150 embryos uh, that were chimeras that were half animal half half man and and i blogged about that too i said oh great so they destroyed 150 what about the 450 that they didn't destroy and it tells about? Are you kidding me? I mean, do we really think these people are ethical on any level? Are you kidding me? When they've got the building blocks of life and they can mess around with it? Super soldiers, are you kidding me? Oh my gosh, this is like, they're kids in a candy store, but it's a demented candy store. And the candy store is really from hell. And this is why he's gotta come back soon because they're messing with stuff that they're never supposed to be messing with. And I believe, again, I believe it's by design. It's by design from the other side. If you go back and if you do, ever do read, you need to be prayed up if you do, otherwise don't. Uh, the book, The Externalization of Hierarchy by Alice Bailey, where the entity, the Tibetan, fused into her mm -hmm. to give exactly what the Spirit of God said in Timothy 4.1, um, didache daemonoia, a literal doctrine inspired directly by, word by word by, by a demonic entity. Now, um, in there is predictions of all of this. See, that's, that's part of the issue. I don't believe it's satanic prophecy. I don't believe he can prophesy because he's not infinite. He's not on both sides of the fence. I believe it's projection. I believe it's part of their, their what they're doing is they're announcing their agenda. Mm -hmm. They can do things and say things and then they manipulate and play games too, like with psychics or whatever, but um, this really was kind of spelling out their agenda. So science and spirit was, according to this in 1937, was to be joined. There would be a, a supranatural science. And I mentioned earlier today, transhumanists, that's not science because they've now added the dimension of the, the, the gods in the sky um, going to help the scientists and guide them. I mentioned Ingo Swan earlier about father modern remote viewing. Where did he get the idea for coordinate remote viewing to give the military to spend $21 million and then let millions of others learn how to do this worldwide? In a pool, Ingo Swan says that the ideas popped into his head from the outside. In Ephesians 6, for the warfare issues in our own lives, uh, you know, put on the full armor of God, there's one aspect, the shield of faith. Lift up the shield of faith by which you can what? extinguish, quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. There is a sender. Now, this is what I found true all across the nation the last six years. 90% of believers didn't understand their authority, number one. And 90% of the believers didn't understand what those arrows were. What are the arrows? 
involuntary communications. Here's a sender identifying a believer. If you can understand this, you've won half the battle when it comes to oppression and can clear the air in five minutes instead of five days. Here's a sender observing you, predatory, looking, seeing, what do I need to send? What truth do I need to encounter? What do I need to pull out of them? What scripture can I pull out of them? How can I cripple them? So the sender devises and sends thought or the impression of feeling against a believer. So all of a sudden, the believer gets involuntary feeling or thought that's contrary to the will of God, the word of God, and the character of Christ. If all of a sudden you have feeling, God's not with me, God's not going to, you know, anything is contrary. It's coming, and all of a sudden you realize, this isn't coming just from me. This is being oppressed upon me. This is being pressed on me. This side knows voice to skull technology beyond the government. And the government may have learned synthetic telepathy and the rest of it. They may have learned it from the dark side. How to create and communicate for the sake of control or the sake of manipulation, voice or communication to skull without the skull knowing it. Um, it's like the movie Inception. It's the idea to plant the idea and make the person think, you know, the, the person they're planting the idea in, that it's theirs. And then once they take it and go with it, all it is is charged content from a sender. And that's what I believe Ingo Swan got. That's what I believe a lot of these guys get, even in the military stuff. I agree with L.A. on the, the basis. I can tell you the Fort Bragg Psy Warrior story, or I can tell you the military uh, corporal that was out of the military, but a corporal of a law enforcement agent that recruited me to be a police chaplain so I could teach on a cult crime, which we didn't discover that this person was a high complex multiple also. Both of them didn't know each other, separate stories, all about underground bases, the communication of military individuals using a triangulation. I mean, this is all within the New Age stuff. It's all within the First Earth Battalion stuff. There is no question in my mind that the practice, the engagement of, um, and specifically, and there's a reason why, underground. You know why? In the book of Revelation, when the wrath of the Lamb begins to come, where, where, do, where, where do all the earthers go? All those who embrace the Luciferian side, where do they go? Where do they run? You know how many bases there are in the United States underground? You know how many tunnels there are? And how this is going on worldwide? You know how entire cities in Russia underground? So where are they going to go when it comes to the wrath of the Lamb and this whole issue? You read the book of Revelation. This is future, exact future history that we can learn now. And it has to be built, though. It has to be done along the way. So there, there's such a, a, a overwhelming guidance. One more thing quickly. Remember also in all of this, the Ezekiel 8 thing. There was a supernatural sense of hiddenness. They have barriers. They even have rituals. In, like in September, uh, the, the Hands of Glory that are called the, um, the ritual is purposely to bring the power of invisibility, to be cloaked. So 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 says that we are ready to know about the, the, the mystery of iniquity. Well, this is the Greek word, mysterium. It, it, it's a reference to a collective. This is uh, the collective. It's uh, the mysterium of lawlessness that is already, in the Greek word, argais. They're already supernaturally operative, and it's all in the context of helping you know, the Antichrist come about. Um, that side's all about long-term, underground, shielded, uh, uh, cloaked uh, secrecy and moving in that direction. And in Ezekiel's day, the only reason he found it was because God wanted him to see and brought him into it. And we've learned the principle of, Lord, we want to go see. We're asking you and targeting and breaking in. And see, that's why I think the spiritual warfare can be applied to those underground things too let alone the above ground things, let alone ritual sites. But the, in our experience of dealing with individuals, driven to bases and everything else, uh, there's no question that the, the, the testimony anyway is they are engaging underground and, and the mutations, just like Ellie told you, we, we heard this all the way back in the 90s from again, US military special ops, I don't want to call it that, it's more than that, uh, black ops in the satanic sense, uh, individuals. And the mutations they talk about and the uh, 
uh, human and animal and everything else. I mean, look at DARPA. Go study DARPA. Go look up Dar DARPA and, and see what they say about gene splicing, taking the gene of a panther that enables the panther to see at night. And if they could take that gene and splice it into the, the DNA of a soldier that all of a sudden allows the soldier to see at night the same way the panther does. <laughs> and that's only what we know. Yeah, think about it. Yeah. This next question uh, is about the, the fingerprints that were left on the wall. Yeah. Uh, were there any further forensic tests run on this? Well, we were the tip of the spear. It's, you know, you would think that scientists would be beating a, um, knocking down Dr. Lear's door. No one cares. It's unbelievable. In fact, there's like a reticence to even get a, well, it, what was that? <clears throat> this man was abducted? Well, I, <laughs> you know, they want anything to do with it. There's fear. There's such fear because, you know, the whole, whole idea of ridicule. If I, if I bring this into my office, in fact, the guy that does the x-rays for us, now he doesn't want to do the x-rays anymore because he was featured in one of the films. We, we, you know, oh, yeah, that'd be cool. Put my name in. Now he doesn't want anything to do with it. Just saying. So we financed that whole thing ourselves. We paid for the extraction of the, um, you know, the implant and, and all the testing. When we took the piece of drywall down and uh, we took samples of it, of, of the fluorescent material on it, we had it an analyzed under a um, standing electron microscope and looked at all the composite of, of minerals and what it should have been, and it was not human. There was nothing human about it. And, you know, and I asked the guy, I kept, you know, because he was not forthcoming. He was not going to weigh in on it in any way. So I had to yank, you know, the, the, the data out of him. Well, what does a human being look like? Well, it looks like this. And he listed off the minerals, you know, carbon and other things. Well, are you trying to tell me that, that whatever this is, you know, isn't human? And finally he said basically just, yes, it's not, nothing here is what, what should be here. And... You know, we still have the piece of drywall. It's it's being it's protected. Um, we could go back in and do other tests. There should be other tests. There should be extensive testing done with the implants. We've got like I think 17 of them now. Uh, Dr. Lear has them. We'd have to figure out what to do with them. But then then what do you do with them? I mean, it, again, it's like Columbus looking at a submarine, a nuclear sub in 1492. Where do you begin? Where do you begin? What's this? It's a wire. What's a wire? You know, that's what you've got. I mean, it's just like, what? And this stuff is so, look, getting in, Russ was saying, like, Ezekiel's taken. You know, Mike Kaiser calls it the divine taxi. It's tongue-in-cheek, but it's true. It's like Gary Stearman points out in Ezekiel uh, chapter 1, when Ezekiel's hanging out, and all of a sudden, the God of the universe shows up on this really cool, you know, he's out for a Sunday drive or something. You know, and Gary's, you know, Gary says this. It's like, whatever it is, God really likes to cruise around on this thing, and he does. And it's alive. But, he, I mean, it's, it's a vehicle, and the thing is moving. And it's got the four creatures and the wheels and this whole, it's like, what the heck is this? And, you know, God's just, this is really fun. Let's stop off at Burger King. I'm hungry. I, you know, I don't know. But it, it's, it's amazing. So it's like, and that vehicle's alive. So there's just so much that we... You know, it's it's maddening, isn't it? We get we get little glimpses in the Bible, and and it just it leads to ten thousand questions which can't be answered. I think what you heard Ellie say earlier too about when he prayed. You know, when they were looking for that little thing inside the, the thing, when he prayed, all of a sudden there it was again. Again, this tells me like we learned uh, again over the years when it came to the underground, the covens. Back when we started this in 1980. We devised a team because we're like, we're, this is bizarre stories. This doctor did what? This military person did that? This, this person over here, they had a ritual over here, what? And so that's why we formed the team in 1980 to like the spies of Israel, but with prayer and, and targeting. We learned, you know, we call it prayer mapping, targeting uh, an underground ritual, underground place, individuals. We've learned that the under, blood and guts underground is deeply covered in satanic power and secrecy and and all the rest uh I, I there's no question about that and that it takes spiritual authority and prayer to bring a breakthrough to, to cut through this 
Now, again, look what happened when they prayed and that thing all of a sudden appeared. It does, if it's their technology or an extension of even their light, their, for, their presence or whatever else, do they have the ability to go invisible? Do they have the ability to keep cloaked and all the rest? That's why I think it's the, that we have to look at, believers should be at the cutting edge of looking into this, but it, with the spearhead of praying, Lord, if this is from the enemy, if this is from the enemy, if that's another from the enemy, let's pray. Let's ask God to, you know, can God do an earthquake like he did in the book of Acts? Um, if we're commanded to expose the evil deeds of darkness, Ephesians 5, right? How can you expose what you don't know about? Bingo. So there's, there, there's a research aspect to this that in our, you know, thing is in the center of our research is still evangelism, the extension of the mission of God and the ministry to people. But, but also, uh, there's no question we have felt like God has pushed us out there like Ezekiel. And that can be applied to the entire, you know, the, the UFOology uh, issue. It can be applied to uh, the technology on that side because it seems to have the same substance and presence and power and physics. And the authority of Christ seems to be able to strike it. So Amen. maybe learning specifically Holy Spirit-led uh, prayer targeting of all these areas will help open the doors and, and pull back the veil and cause us to see more so that we can say, this is of the enemy. Warn the non-believer, bring them to Christ, you know, engage the church, and let them know what the other side is doing. This is uh, actually a full one we had uh, people in North Carolina who have been watching all day, and they sent in a message with a question. Um, they said, do you know a lot about the spiritual activity in Pennsylvania and Russ? And they would like to know if you know anything about the Durham, North Carolina area, or if you would know where they could possibly get some information about that as far as public activity, uh, Sure. Sure. We've been down once to that down that area again. To, to, we were flown down to minister to an individual that was an SRA, a chosen one. They are completely healed and completely delivered and doing very, very well for the last eight years. Um, I, I could tell you this, just to give one piece for down there. Look for a place called Ravens Tower, close to Fort, the Fort with. Brag, Gary. <laughs> look for look for what's called Raven's Tower, Raven's Wood. Look for again on a physical secrecy. It's one thing, but a supernatural secrecy. So you're going to have to really apply the prayer part of this and really ask the Lord to come in and and tear through and say, Lord, show us. On our website, shadowthedarkness.net, on the right side that says free training courses. If you click on it, it's all absolutely free. You click on it, it'll list all these courses free. One of the courses is called Dark Powers, Dark Rituals. It's 14 hours. The first one is, how do you detect whether there's a coven and this kind of activity in your city or area? It goes through seven indicators that will tell you that there's ground level, heavy, you know, human sacrificial stuff going on. And those seven categories are true, have been true over the last you know, 25 years of dealing with this stuff. Those seven categories are there. Then it deals with how to respond, how to go further, how to uh, even law enforcement, a couple just for law enforcement when they're investigating the, the, the underground. Um, so if you're going to research it and investigate it, you got to be prayed up. We love taking teams all over the place. We've been to so many places in the last 30 years, including flying to France and Poland and Germany and all that. We got a lot of other things to do. But if we were to go down there, this is what I'm saying, I believe you can find it in this area or your city. I'm convinced there's not a city in the United States that does not have this, this underground network that goes outside and it's multi-continental. Um, Absolutely. And it, and it is the mysterium as far as the physical side and the spiritual you know, side of it. The undergrounders, you know, there's the deception with the New Agers and the ufologists, that's a lot of the metaschizmatite, the, 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 it's masqueraded deception. The undergrounders, it's blood and guts real. They know power demons, they know entities, they know, they know what they're into and they know what they're, what they're doing. But I would just say for them, if they can go and get the free course, that will give them training, 14 hours of launching out with a team and in your area and doing it the way we do in the sense you're, you're doing it to uh, expose radical evil, uh, evangelize, praying to find victims. 
We learned over the years, uh, because they're to be kept in silence anyway, but I believe demonically, they're also demonically charged or, or possessed or demonized to stay hidden, to stay you know, undetected. But in the prayers to find them, it's, a, it's amazing how we end up finding victims uh, in, in, our, in, in our search. So if in your city or that city, if they're going to pray and pray and say, God, bring the victims here. Do you have SRA victims? You can't have an SRA victim without having the coven that created them. And then you're going to, you're, you know, helping them, you're going to find things. But you will be able to make enough of a beeline so that you can prayer map that out. What I mean is just write it all down and target it in, in such prayer, thunder the prayers. One example a law enforcement agent brings me the Fort Bragg uh, individual out of the ancient brotherhood, out of Pennsylvania, back into Ohio. Uh, prior to them leaving, they were talking about warfare, all the things they do. And I began to ask questions about um, their coven group and all this stuff. So when I walked away from this, I'm saying, Lord, how do we deal with this? Reminding me of the book of Timothy, chapter 2, when, first of all, urgency of prayers and requests and thanksgiving and intercession, right? Well, there's a Greek word there, not just for general prayer, but a specific desis, meaning request. Give specific. So what I did is I took that scripture verse and I took all the information this person gave me. I wrote it on a piece of paper. This is 25 years ago or 20 some years ago. Wrote it all down and I began to just pray and ask the Holy Spirit to give anything else to that. Begin to thunder prayer. Three weeks later, when that person's brought back, they jump out of the car of this officer and they look at me and they literally yelled, what have you been doing? You've been doing your spiritual warfare, you know? Um, and I, inwardly, I'm smiling, and I didn't want to give her any information, so I just said, why? What's going on? And she was just dogmatic, you know? We haven't been able to get a spirit to show up in the last three weeks. Um, I took the names of the people she gave. I took the names of the everything, the locations, and I just began to thunder a prayer against all of that and ask God's hand to go there, to engage it, and just whatever the Spirit of God gave. And that's when we learned how we can target how the, their power is in their secrecy mm -hmm. uh, or where there's nobody to contest it. Okay. Something can be done. All right, here's the next question. It's something that I want both of you to touch on uh, at one point or another. <clears throat> um, how do you feel about stargates or interdimensional portals, uh, such as the Bermuda Triangle, different? If you um, if you go from the pyramid in Giza, it is you can make a line from Giza, and you go right through Cusco, uh, Paracas, and and out and out further, out to Easter Island, I believe. Straight lines. Um, these are power places. I mean, there's a, there's a tour called Power Places Tour. Uh, Chichen Itza, you know, we were supposed to go to Chichen Itza. And um, a quick little story on that. Uh, I was asked by a, a new age group to speak on 2012 at Chichen Itza. And I didn't want to go. And I'm on the phone with Richard Grun one day. And the Lord speaks to me and says, why are you afraid of the prophets of Baal? And I just went, ooh. I guess I'm not afraid of the prophets of Baal, Lord. That was my marching orders to go. And I just was, I really did not want to go. And I said, well, I'm not going without two of my buddies, Dizdar and, and Grun. And so we were all set to go. We had raised, and that was a fleece that we put out. We raised the money to go. It was like $4,000 a person. That was for airfare and, you know, lodging and all the stuff on the tour. And so we're, we're ready to go. And, you know, we, we would talk strategy and what we were going to do and how we were going to pray and, you know, there was all this strategy and stuff. And for whatever reason, Saturday night, um, my daughter, I'd, I'd been away on some conference or something. My daughter has this dream. And in the dream, uh, she hears this voice. And the voice says, don't go, this type of thing. And she tells me about this. This is on Saturday night. And I'm going, well, Sarah, you know, it, we're leaving on Thursday. We're going. Everything's paid. It can't be refunded. We're going. And so, but I said, but we'll pray about it. It's one of those little things. And so... You know, Father, if this is from you in Jesus' name, reveal it. You know, one of those, please, you know, this is, he, he won't answer, it's okay, right? That type of thing. He answers like like less than 30 seconds later, and I, it's like the answer comes in, it's like the whole Abraham thing, with Abraham taking Isaac up to get sacrificed. 
which is an analogy I was using all year, that I was the sacrifice uh, for Chichen Itza. And I looked at my wife, I said, Peggy, I think I, we just got answered. So we go to dinner, and I call Russ when we get to dinner, and I go, Russ, you're not going to believe this, but I think the Lord's telling us to stand down. Well, at the same time this is going on, and this is going to go somewhere with the whole portal thing, at the same time this is going on, Russ is up in his room, in his prayer room, just praising the Lord and finally just surrendering because he was told not to go when he was in France. And he'd been fighting and fighting and fighting, so he comes downstairs, how the heck am I going to tell L.A. That, we're that I'm being told to stand down and not go? And, and there's my, my you know, um, message on his answering machine. And Richard Grun, who's like, give me a dwarf, he never backs down from anything. You know, it's like, no matter what the odds are, let's go. Yeah, it's like, Rich, easy, easy. But he, he wakes up the following morning, and he's really, uh, you know, at, at, not at peace and very um, just wrestling with the whole idea. And he, and, he, and he actually said, Lord, if there's a way to stop this, I don't want to go. And we were called off. The point I'm trying to make is, at Chichen Itza, had we been there, who knows what might have really happened. That place is a power place. That place is a gateway. That place is a portal. It's open. It's charged. 50,000 people um, were sacrificed ritualistically there. And other places all over the globe, all over the globe, even in Ohio, like we talked about the Great Circle Mount, human remains were found on an altar in the Great Circle Mount. You know, and they always, the archaeologists and the anthropologists don't know what they're looking at because they don't believe in the supernatural, so they just kind of downplay it, you know. And it's always serpent worship. Why, oh, why, why never a funny little bunny rabbit? It's always the serpent, always the serpent. The serpent motif is in everywhere. So gateways and portals are, are charged places where ritualistic sacrifice have happened numerous times, and the gateways and portals are open, which allow these entities to come. And in some places, they still control large squaths of property, large land masses, because no one's ever taken the land back. No one's ever closed the gateway. And there's sickness and there's depression, and human beings um, live in poverty and, and disease. And I mean, it's, it's, that's the fruit of it. So yes. Yes, portholes and, and so forth. Because in, in, in a human life, you know, we're told the Spirit of God tells us in Ephesians 4, you know, be angry, but don't sin, don't let the sun go to your anger, and so give the devil a, you know, don't give the devil a foothold. The Greek word topon, meaning in, in, in Koine Greek, it was a legal right, but it also had the idea of, you know, an entrance, a door, a, a gate. So even in our lives, we can allow, you know, if we get into the flesh long enough, we're literally giving the enemy a legal right and doorway to grab a hold of that area. Well, that's true in the larger ways. Um, that's why any place in the Old Testament you see, um, any human sacrificial area, like with um, Manasseh, starting uh, in Kings chapter 22, 2 Kings chapter 22, he opens up everything to the starry host, everything yeah. he can get his hands on, and then it leads to eventually him sacrificing his own son on a, on a, on a slab at Tobiah, um, to Moloch. And so it leads from the light and so-called so light level all, all the way to this other stuff. But what I'm saying is these places were open, where shed blood and where rituals were done and, and where the doorways are open. How about a haunted house? There's not a ghost. It's either a demon you know, or, or somebody ate pizza and they just think it's something there. Um, you know, a lot of the paranormal you know, ghost hunters, you know what's happening with them? They're chasing all these entities, and there's, are you there? And the little machine, are you there? I think I heard a voice say, yes, I'm here. Um, <laughs> so are you there? You know what they're all in, a lot of them, you know, many of them are saying now, we got into this, something really was there, and it followed us home. You gave open door. You gave a reason. You gave a right to them to begin to engage. Think about now, spiritually guided, the Chech, you know, the, the old Mayans or whatever, or anywhere in the world where you see the ziggurat, you know, the stairs and the flat top. Why, why that design? Right. Why the flat top? Is this a place like an apocalypto where they chop the heads off? You know, that's one thing about Mel's uh, version of that. I think it was, you know, very accurate as far as how the blood ran and what they did. He didn't show the appearance of the serpent, you know, along the stairs when the sun came into a certain area. He didn't talk about the inside chambers where a uh, PK man, a Psy man, written about years ago, and others have gone to, uh, to engage the spirits. Where the demons and the demon gods were, Moloch, Baal, Shemosh, all the rest of them, did they die? Even when 
even when in the Old Testament, now this is what happened to happen. What did Josiah do? We have a, our prayer thing for our shattered prayer thing is called Project Josiah. What did Josiah do? When Josiah, you know, rose up, and of course he had a, a prophetic word from Huldah, and, and, and the scriptures were given, and, and a leading of repentance, because they became worse than the pagan nations around them. God was coming to say, I'm going to judge these, my people, because they're worse in their demon worship, human sacrifice. It's in the temple. They had uh, Asherah poles being made inside the temple. Okay? All, what, you know what happened with Josiah? Josiah became willing, and there was a bubble of time of grace for a period of time. And here's what Josiah did. And this is why I think, he is, I think Josiah is a tremendous example. Josiah went around doing what? Shutting down all of the ritual sites, grinding all the objects. Why grind them? Why make them into powder? Why, why throw them into a latrine so the charged objects can't be recovered later on? Because the charged objects that has a demon on it, you throw it in the, the, over here and behind the garage, guess what? The entity is going to be looking for somebody. You build a, a Chechen Itza, you build a ziggurat, and you have demon gods that are in the air over and on the ground and blood and blood down the stairs and underneath. That place is their, their place. It's still charged in a sense. Um, and, when, and, and, and these entities, they're just simply doing what? Calling people back. Reopen the gateway. Bring it all back to us. In all of, the, um, in all of these uh, uh, ziggurat things, why, why did they have little, little rooms in the top and fruit? Because the portholes were open, and in there, whether you believe them or not, the, the entities would come and, and, and step down. Mm -hmm. Some believe the Nephilim, because of the highly charged Nephilim architecture and everything about it, that they were able to go to the top and they were able to step off on the other side and step back onto this side. Whether we believe it or not, that's what they were practicing, that the, the, the gods would step and come here. That's why they would leave virgins up there for them and food for them because they would step off and step on the high uh, plateau of one of those ziggurats. There's no question they did, and I think the biblical you know, record indicates this. I think uh, the Hall of the Dead in, in Vadelsburg is still an active major Absolutely. porthole. I don't think just our prayer alone went and stopped it. I do believe there's an effect, and we're still waiting to see uh, Michael Aquino, whether he's going to call us or not. Um, so we, we love to engage um, in, in, in a lot of ways because... There's a lot of uh, victimization behind it. But portholes, there's no question in my mind. At, uh, at Saksi Laman, there's uh, what we call thrones. It can only be described that way. And it's at the top. There's like the Saksi Laman, the structure. This is in Peru. It's about 13,000 feet above sea level. And, and there's, there's these stone walls, ancient, ancient, ancient stone walls. And these stones, some of them have, I, I, maybe tomorrow I'll show you some pictures, whatever, but they're, they're polygonal shapes. They're like, 8, 10, 12, 13, 14 side stones. And they're not small stones. Some of these things weigh 120 tons. And the quarry is 40 to 50 miles away. And all they have is a llama. It's not going to fly. It's just, you know, it's not 150 llama mule train. You know, it's just, it's not going to work. And these things are fitted with, with such precision that a human hair can't fit between the cracks. We were there. So Brian Forrester, our guide, leads us in, and we come in the back way, sort of, and on top, overlooking the entire complex, is out of, out of indigenous rock that's there, are these thrones which are carved in. I mean, they're thrones. There's no other way of looking at it. They are thrones, and they're big thrones. They're not to fit a normal human being. Something much larger would fill that throne. You know, when you stand in a place like that, and for us, it was like Nephilim architecture. I mean, that's what we've labeled it. That's what we call it, all these sites now. You know, the New Ages call them sacred sites. We go baloney, it's Nephilim architecture. It's fallen angel architecture. It defies what we can do in modernity. I've gone to stonemasons, I've gone to architects. They kind of look at you and, and laugh nervously. Engineers say, well, how did they do this? Well, uh, <laughs> well, well I don't know. They had technology that's been lost to us, L.A., yeah, that's what it is. It's like, what are you talking about? You don't know, you don't, have a, you don't have a stinking clue how these guys put this stuff together. And it's a technology that's lost. We have no idea. There's no tools or artifacts found in any of these sites. No carpet chisels, ding, 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 ding. None of it. 
None of it's there. Whoever did it came and left, and here it is. There's no signature, you know. We built this in memorial of nothing like that. The edifice itself. And these are all charged sites. They're all in line with Giza. It's very, very deliberate. And they're all resurfacing again. Ancient grid. I got to go to the men's room. Is this on tape? I should not have said that. Um, there's this issue, too, with um, the, you know, an individual can have a, a you know, a, a gateway or a hole in their life. Um, so an individual can have a doorway, an open doorway in their life. A ritual site in a, in a home or in a site area, if it's highly charged and used, you can have presence there. You can walk into an area, you can walk into a house, you can see it. Okay? A city can have over it. It's like the Prince of Persia. Um, and you got to understand, the dark side understands how to do that. Five reasons for doing a ritual. One, so, you know, to bring the demons and summon them, bring them in for more power. Two, summon the demon to transmit it into the other members of the coven. Three, summon the demons and um, cloak and cover your coven in supernatural secrecy and power. Uh, four, summon demons and target your enemies, pastors, churches, whoever else, and send them. Five, when I heard this one, I had to ask the person over and over and ask many other since, summon the demons, send them in the air to dirty the air and to have air superiority over a city. That was my answer from a full brag, chosen one cyborg. Air, Satan is the prince of the power of the Greek word eros, meaning the immediate dense atmosphere. And so you, you think in terms of even that to create, to create presence, to create opposition, to create, and that's only, that's only the first stages. So when you do, create the temples again how many ziggurats are in the world they were just they were just utter, a lot of these places were utterly wiped out in the flood and then since that time rebuilt utterly wiped out just like josiah these things had to be wiped out okay one place it's a ziggurat where human sacrifice is done and nephilim are worshiped and maybe have interaction with the with the you know in the in the in the in the heavenlies interaction with the beings and it becomes a living porthole it's 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 open it's wide open just like in Daniel's day Daniel's day the city of Babylon had 56 different temples where summoning and, and demonic worship and all the rest would occur with different gods so that the entire city would have been just spiritually inundated because once you have it on the ground and, you, and you're doing the stuff, you're opening the doorway into the, into the, realm, in the heavenly realms. Well, then take it another step. Say you have a ziggurat, which would be a high-powered place, a very big way of doing this, and you mentioned that there's some in line. Now, I just saw this out for your own research. Begin to look at where all the ziggurats and pyramids and Nephilim architecture is around the world. It's my opinion that they were coordinated to help bring a spiritual grid mm -hmm. around the world and to, to try to claim and to cloak and, to, and to, take, to take all of it. I believe the rise of Babylon, Revelation 18, gives you the culmination. Look what it says, Babylon, the home of every demon, every foul, you know, referring to every kind of demonic presence. The manifestation of demonic presence in cities and over cities on a global scale, will be beyond Babylon uh, far, by far. Mm. And all because of the portholes and the doorways, whether large or small. All right, the next question says, regarding SRA victims in their collection, are there any commonalities in your experience that might indicate any susceptibility or potentially an individual who would well, primarily in all the cases, it's bloodline. It's um, with it with it beginning the way it did in Lavensborn. Um, again, all all first generation SRAs that are between fifty five and sixty five will have parents or people within them that were most likely German and spoke German that were connected to the old Black Flame and connected to Lavensborn. That's why they know clearly it's pure blood. It's master race oriented stuff. So. The selection is simply plotted, planned, purposeful breeding. 
um, they don't look at it as having, oh, this is our little baby, you know, this is our little baby. They look at it as they're furthering a project. So in, in the Lavensbord projects, um, Nazi soldiers would come to the Lavensbord in places where all the, the Aryan German girls were. You didn't have to be married. You didn't have to be married at all. Just go in, and, and the, the only goal was to get them pregnant so they would have babies. You can find now some of the uh, videos on Lebensborg and see hundreds of babies on tables and the you know, German ladies taking care of them. Those are the Aryan uh, life source uh, babies that were being born. If there's some, and I believe there are still living, they'd be in their late 70s and early 80s because of being, well, all the way up to 45 anyway. But that project continued. So... The, it's not like they can just go to you or you know somebody here and just say, we're, we're going to take you and we're going to split you and we're going to begin to do this process. Though I think they've been trying. It all begins in the demonized blood of a chosen mother, chosen father, copulating, creating a, you know, a conception, demonizing that conception and bringing forth in their view. They don't see it as a baby. They see it as a chosen one in the project. And it's all there to be dissociated, designed, Causing it trauma and causing that, that's just part of what it's all about. Punishment and everything else, that's, that's part of the order. You, you, they, they learn this. And that's why if there's no intervention, and we had to learn this again late along the way, every, uh, every first generation multiple that we give, we begin to look at the kids, and every one of them are multiples. And then we begin to look at those who are you know, then older in life, every one of their kids were. So we begin to go down the line and track it, uh, it is purely a bloodline generational um, selection at this time. Whether it goes outside that fence, now I do believe in some cases they have adopted or pulled in or stole kids. Usually the stealing of kids is for sacrifice, but uh, there's in some cases I believe they might have pulled them in young enough to try to split and, and do the same thing. But it's, I don't know if it's the same because the original selection and ritual for the womb to, to charge, to demonize the actual uh, baby, they would consider a fetus, to actually demonize it uh, to the point of their goal of altering DNA and, and, and changing it. it um, it's all begins there. So um, it's in that bloodline. All right. And uh, I Yeah, I, I remember um, 1 John 3, 8, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy works the devil's the works. I believe the creation of SRA is the devil's works. I believe they're victims. How, do, how does a, how does a, a baby, you know, uh, whether in, in pedophilia or human trafficking, how do they choose to do any of that? So when it comes to SRA, they didn't choose this issue that was chosen already. And, and so, yes, um, yes, uh, working with SRAs, which involves, um, which involves a high level of warfare issues, deliverance issues, inner healing issues, um, and, and restoration issues, uh, uh, yes, they should seek. And I would say that what we can offer just offhand is on our website again, shadowthedarkness.net on the right side, free courses, click it look down the listing of courses and you'll find freedom encounters. There's 27 hours of basic training on how to bring salvation, help, deliverance, healing, break programming and help an SRA military or non-military one and help them, you know, you know, break out of it. And I don't believe they can break out unless it's with Jesus. I don't believe they can get free without Jesus because it's such a design of the dark side uh, the only way to get out of it, really, is the real, the real Christ. But it does take patience. It does take time. God will give you skills. There's a price to pay, but a glory to see that far outweighs the price. And um, with as many as on the field, and I believe half of them are intact. If, I, if there really is 10 million United States, let's just dumb it down to 5 million. Uh, let's say that half of that 5 million is seeking help, so they're not even in the projects any longer. They won't be triggered to kill anybody. Let's, let's dumb it down to one million 
program sleepers in the United States that are demonized and charged, if a corporate trigger is given, one million, how about a half a million released in the United States? What would happen? So I, I think we under, need to understand that, that, that all that we read in prophecy that the enemy is going to do has a boots on the ground development that has to be in place. The Antichrist can't have an apocalypse if he wasn't born and raised in the system and old enough and ready to go, nor the false prophet. So um, please, yeah, just, um, and in your cities, if you begin to pray, Lord, lead us to, you know, here, this is what we did back in the 80s. We, because we, none of the, we had, we had 900 churches in our area and I was pastoring church and it's like, um, demonized people were coming, churches were bringing us demonized people. It's like, Lord, why don't the other churches, you know, and we're telling other churches to deal with it and so forth. And I, I saw the agony in lives. And so we just said in the 80s, this is what we said, Lord, send us anybody you want to. We'll never, ever charge them. Uh, we'll, we'll do this and we'll, we'll, we'll minister to whoever you send. <laughs> and God sent them from 54 churches in our local area and from out of state. They begin to come and it's not stopped. It's not stopped in 30 years. Um, we have people that <laughs> that we, we don't even we don't have the ability to even get to everybody. But but um, when you get prepped and you get ready and you get you know Luke te chapter ten and you launch out to to be a soul winner and a and a pr person who can pray for healing and you know your authority you can deal with the demonic side and you'll let the Holy Spirit teach you how to bring healing to the inner broken fragmented personality of, of an SRA. Um, then you are you're dealing with I think you know uh, uh, the agenda that's right there. That's 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 the devil's prize. You're dealing with the soldiers, and so you're going to get spiritual warfare, and you're going to get a lot of other things. But I'm I'm answering this long, I know, because I want you to know that many of you here can step out and do this. Um, many of that are listening can step out and do this. All it takes is Isaiah six. Isaiah, in response to the glory of the Lord, said, "What? Here am I. Send me." He will Amen. teach you along the way. Even yes, if you learn it the hard way, even if you have to cry a lot in the middle of the night, four o'clock in the morning after doing deliverance and seeing a little 13-year-old that should have had a happy life and should have been able to play and should be able to, it should be a little virgin. She's been sexually raped, you know, 600 times and but demonized and split and, 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 and programmed to kill herself. Um, so go ahead, be outraged at the dark side. Don't, don't ever fear the dark side. Defy the dark side in the name of the Lord. And know your shielding and know Psalm 91, but defy the dark side, give your life. 30 years, <laughs> we've been slapped, punched, kicked at, stabbed at, whatever else, spit on, <laughs> demon sent, dead animals, whatever else. You know what? We've seen salvation. We've seen deliverance. We see the glory of the Lord. We see the power of God. I, I, you know, I could go on and tell you story after story after story of seeing the hand of God that has just transformed lives. Um, we have one girl I'll tell you about that uh, flew down to North Carolina I told you about earlier. And the last seven personalities were all German speaking. And when they, when they came up, they looked around. They hadn't been up in 17 years to see, see the world around them because they were sleepers down. And when we asked the Lord to come in and we asked you know, the Lord to heal them for them to go to Jesus and to be healed. And then they were all gone. This girl has been, uh, she's been whole for eight years. No, no voices, no triggers, no demons. And she just loves Jesus and, and she wrote a book just on her personal faith. And we've talked about writing a book together and talk about her life. But it's tremendous to see what God has done. The glory and the goodness and the great things far outweigh uh, the radical evil. And without us on the field to do it, yes, we give, we all, in our silence or in our hidden fears as the body of Christ, let alone our, you know, our, our disobedience to the Lord, but we simply aid and abed uh, the enemy to, be, to have a free reign. Yes, and 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 I think we should. I think we should fight like heaven. Yeah. Okay. All right. Is that good? All right. Well, let's give him a hand, everybody. Thank you, brother Russ. Thank you, brother La. Look forward to tomorrow morning. Going to be here, Lord willing, at ten o'clock. Come a little early if all of our guests that are joining us this week are here. We'll be pretty full tomorrow morning. And we'll just expect God to do some great things. Amen? Amen. Well, let's close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this evening. God, we thank you for your spirit at work in the earth, Lord, in our lives, God. We just ask you to keep everybody safe. Bring us back here tomorrow. Exciting. Lord, let us be expecting for you to show up, God. 
The atmosphere of expectancy is the breeding ground for miracles. So, God, we thank you for that. And Lord, we just pray that in advance, God, for people tomorrow to be healed, delivered, set free. God, for you just to take control of the service by the power of your Spirit. And we'll give you all the praise and the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Extraterrestrials and beings. Uh, one of the Stargate uh, individuals who wrote the book Psychic Warrior, uh, David Morehouse, <laughs> in the book talks about how he engaged an entity out there. And Ed Dames and the rest. So they're all, all the remote viewers that were in the military, they're, they're also believing in an engagement. So um, I believe it's very similar to the Nazis, uh, but maybe even, maybe even broader. Let me just add to that real quick. I, I concur with Russ. Um, allegedly, and this is, you know, apocryphal stuff. Someone asked uh, Werner von Braun, you know, where did you guys get this from? And he just said, we had help from them. Um, we've heard that quote that's been kicked around UFO. Um, there's, a, there's a series called Taken that Steven Spielberg was the executive producer of. And that is the most on, spot on presentation I've seen on the subject. And they take it from the Foo Fighters to present day. And they get the abduction phenomena, they get the breeding program, they get what they're looking for. The conclusion is very similar to what I would believe in, except they sort of couch it as a benevolent thing. And the, the, the hybrid being who they've been waiting for is a little girl instead of a little boy. But she can stop time. She can, you know, do, she's got telekinesis powers. She's got power. And I think that, that the governments, um, I think it's just like, it's a really interesting question. If, it, if, they, if they force someone to take it, then free will isn't involved. I got a hunch people will be lining up for this thing. And I, I mean it, lining up for it, fighting over to get it. Think about it. Let's say we've all seen cancer. We know what it does. So, you know, um, you're married. That is just a scenario. And you're, you find out that, oh, my God, your wife has terminal stage four cancer. And, you know, two weeks later, these guys land and our government comes out and we've known about them and now they're here and blah, blah, blah. And they've got this DNA chip and, you know, some of your neighbors rush. You're, you're kind of hesitant at first. And, and, you know, we hear reports and people are getting healed and spontaneous healings and people are regenerated. And you look at your neighbor who was 60. Now he looks like he's you know, 40 or something. I mean, who knows how far this thing's going to go? Look, let me just end with this because I could blab on for, for a while on this, on this subject. In, in the Bible, it talks about Abraham and Sarah. They're 90 years old. I wrote about this in the Cosmic Chess Match. They're 90 years old, and, and you know, God has got a great sense of humor shows up and goes, hey, guess what? This time next year, Sarah's going to be pregnant. <laughs> you know, and, and, and he does a face plant. Abraham just does a face plan. They go, hey, nothing works anymore. Being, we're all adults here, but that's what he's saying. And Sarah's laughing. You know, I'm way old past the age of childbearing years. How's this going to happen? Why is it that when they go down the days of Noah, when the book of Enoch, when there was a quid pro quo, when you give us access to the female population, we'll show you this technology. Can I prove that? No. But Philip Corso, the late Philip Corso, before he died, and, you know, why would, why would he print a book like this? Talked about the dissemination of so-called um, alien or whatever you want to call it, fallen angel technology that he, they, they back-engineered from the Roswell crash. So there's a lot of apocryphal stories out there floating around. And my gut feeling is, is what, what Farr has said on the Fox News channel, that, that, you know, extraterrestrials are running the government. That doesn't surprise me at all. You know, it really doesn't. Like I said, Al Gore was born nine after. All right. The next question, uh, do you believe a person can be forced to take the mark of the beast? And I'm assuming that this pertains to the, uh, the implant. Well, let's, let's walk through that, it, depending on when we think we're going to get beamed out of here. Um, I think we're beamed out before we are forced one way or the other. Okay, that's my personal opinion. I don't think we're going to be around the scene of that. I hope I'm right. But um, I just can't believe that the Lamb's going to allow us to go through 
uh, the, the whole bloody bride deal. You know, it's like, well, I love you, church, but you're going to go through hell in a handbasket. I just, I just got a problem with that. But um, that's. A okay. I was waiting for that. Are we live? Now, now we're, we're live. They missed it. I think they missed it. <laughs> All right. Any other thoughts on the government? You got to turn it on. Any other thoughts on the government? That's a broad one. <laughs> the government as it pertains to fallen angels. Well, I'll just speak. Uh, yeah, I think that uh, just like the Nazis, uh, remember they looked at the they looked at the entities as non-human entities wherever they came from. So, uh, and then the whole thing with the Foo Fighters and their see the Nazis at the very end engaged a whole world in the in the, in the early forties a whole world of them of of UFOs and Foo Fighters and and so their belief was uh, already helping to open the door. In the 40s, then, of course, we have, you know, Babylon working. We have the Roswell incident. You have all kinds of stuff break open in the 40s. With the United States government, with them taking in everything, I, I personally believe, and even in the underground stuff, the Psy Warriors and the rest, the stories are very clear. They are, on a telepathic level, they say, communicating with entities, non-human entities. So if they look at them as alien or as a master race, I mean, when you have folks that are in the U.S. military, Defense Department, uh, DIA, CIA, uh, individuals uh, that um, are remote viewers out of Stargate that believe in... On the Egypt, Pharaoh wants her in her harem. Is it possible? Is it, and this is the work of Chuck Missler. Thanks, Chuck. Is it possible that Sarah and Abraham were regenerated? That he reversed the clock. Why would why would Pharaoh want a ninety year old woman in the harem? Think about that. Come on, my my grandma, my mother is ninety two and lives with us. I love my mom dearly, but this is not harem material. Trust me. I'm sorry, Lynn. So it's like that's you know I that's what I think. I think this mark is going to be something that's that's way beyond anything. You know, we got to think outside the box. Revelation 13, the uh, mark, um, remember again, the ascendancy of the false prophet. Uh, this is very important in all of this because that mark doesn't begin to be operative until the ascendancy of the false prophet. Revelation 13, the mark is coming out, the image of the beast is ordered to be made. Then it does say in that chapter that then he, the false prophet, through these means will cause forced worship of the beast. Now, that's, a, I mean, a pressured thing, not in the sense of maybe free will, but, you know, the Jews, they all had to get stamped, you know, to, do, to be identified. So part of the issue of the mark, the original Greek word means a branding. It's like a cow getting branded. So there's an identification issue, let alone whatever else is, you know, involved with it. Uh, but you have the issue of those who don't take it. So it's clear in the prophetic form that there are those who are not going to. Uh, 